This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. face is so clear, down to the crinkles across her nose, strands of red hair plastered across her forehead. There's a golden shimmer around her that John's never seen before. Momentarily, he considers he might be dead. She smiles and runs towards him, arms outstretched. Daddy! Trees give to the wild wind, and to his left, children's laughter floats across. Olivia, watch the road! Her school backpack bounces behind her as she takes no heed. He hears the truck before he sees it, just like in his dreams. John sucks in some air. Pain explodes across his body. He can't see. Fuck! As he tries to move, his muscles scream in protest. He gives up, waiting for the pain to pass. But it doesn't. Something's digging into his throat. Everything hurts. Every inch of him singing out in agony. Raising a hand to inspect the damage, he winces as fingers dab the swelling and stickiness across his eyes. He tries to force them open, and only a limited amount of moonlight punctures the darkness to his right. His left eye remains completely closed. Voices echo in his head. Do it, Vince. Tear him apart. Filthy fucking pervert! To a chorus of laughter, howls, and smashing bottles. Pass the knife, then. He can still see Jessica in the corner, and can't bring himself to believe she's wearing a smile. It was relentless. Fists, boots, coming from all directions, his head bouncing off the wooden floor, each soft thud accompanied with laughter or a squeal. Things they made him do. Depraved, inhuman acts. He can see their faces hovering above him. Wild eyes, frenzied smiles sporting blackened teeth. Faces he'll take to the grave. His insides feel like they're on fire. Warily, he runs his fingers over his chest and examines the misshapen bones that press against flesh. Fuck. He thinks he feels something leaking inside. He begins to wheeze, gasping for breath, unable to get any air. (laughs) Three, two, one. Screaming in agony as pain explodes through every part of him, he rolls onto his side and begins hacking at the ground, each convulsion feeling as though it's ripping his insides further apart. Thick mucus spews onto the wet mud and he counts three teeth in the dark-looking discharge. More broken fragments swim around in his saliva. I don't deserve this. I'm a good man. Thrusting his hands into the colorless, marshy ground, letting out a series of garbled cries and screwing his face up in agony, he manages to heave himself into a sitting position. Dampness across the front of his pants evokes more flashbacks of the taunting. Was it Paul? Yes, Paul, the evil son of a bitch. Jessica, come here and slice us a sausage. Look, he's already made the gravy. The sound of the subsequent and grating (laughs) laughter adds a further chill. That's the last thing he remembers. Must have passed out. It's the most alone he's ever felt. Nobody out there looking for him. Nobody out there likely to even care if he stayed down. A breeze rushes across, caressing the sticky tears that run down his face. Pathetic, John. What the hell were you thinking? Why the hell would she be interested in you? 
Biting his already swollen lip, he squelches his feet into the mud, praying that he can support his weight. Pain rips through his legs, but he manages to stand, examining his blood-saturated clothes and the wounds that run up his entire body. No clue where he is. He instinctively pats his right hip, searching for his phone, but only finds more tenderness. Wiping the tears away with the back of a bloody sleeve, he surveys the desolate area, feeling adrenaline beginning to take over. No room for compassion or empathy. Most town folks don't know true pain, walking around with a chip on their shoulders as if the world owes them. The fucking injustice of it all. He thought he knew anger. This town, eating him alive, dog eat dog, but this... This is the icing on the fucking cake. All this world does is take from me! Even the moon's unsympathetic and unwavering stare riles him tonight. I don't deserve this. Someone to talk to was all he wanted. Some company. He knew what Jessica was, but he was prepared to pay good money just for her to listen. Since the accident, he's been so withdrawn, drinking himself into a stupor most days. Evie left him. They tried, but she was just so full of resentment. In a run of bad luck, he was let go from his job that day, arranged with Evie that he'd pick Olivia up from school. The one time. Fuck this life. Sometimes he struggles to recall Olivia's face, as though each day that passes she fades a little. The pain doesn't, though. Talking about her in the bar brought her back a little. He even started referring to her in the present tense. Jessica listened, nodded, even asked questions, all while tenderly stroking his arm and with eyes full of compassion. He didn't know such evil existed. She drove him to the ATM, and he withdrew just shy of a thousand dollars, all the money he had left. Said she had a place where they could talk more, could stay the night even, and he had no reason to believe otherwise. I'm a good man, he mutters into the wind. It's too much. His body stiffens with anger and hate, pain taking a back seat to all the bile that he's been keeping inside for too long. Trembling with rage, he tastes more blood, but this time at his own doing, what teeth he has left ripping through his bulbous lip. Against the backdrop of the moon, he roars, an animalistic release of fury that feels eerily natural. The sloshy ground makes for hard going as he drags his right leg behind, following the only tire tracks in the mud. He's no idea what will happen when he gets there, if he makes it. A cripple with broken insides and a half-open eye against four, but he continues to romanticize with thoughts of violent revenge. It's just enough fuel to keep him from collapsing and curling into a ball. So much pain. Every move is like shards of glass digging at his insides. He's making slow progress, and it all feels so futile. His wife's words echo in his head. I just can't look at you anymore, John. I can't get it out of my head that you could have done something to prevent it. A light in the distance. As John approaches, he doesn't doubt that it's the same barn. They couldn't even be bothered to drop him more than a few hundred yards away. Druggies are so lazy, he mutters under his breath. Our little girl, John. Thanks to you, she's gone. It wasn't my fault! He screams into the night. The smell hit him as soon as Jessica swung the barn door open. A stale cocktail of beer, cigarettes, and all sorts of rank scents warning him off. After you, Jessica said, offering a wink. He saw the needles on the table as soon as he walked in, and then the others stepped out from the shadows, and the door slammed shut. Pausing for a second to catch his breath, and allowing another wave of pain to do its worst, 
he considers what the hell he's hoping to achieve. Momentarily, he contemplates turning back, but he knows from now on it will be their faces he sees in his dreams instead of Olivia's. He's sick of living his life in fear. No more. Forcing himself onwards, he veers slightly away from the trail, heading towards the darkest side of the building. As he arches his neck against the wind, only the rustle of nearby trees and the chorus of crickets can be heard above his squelching footsteps. He spots the truck around the back. Moonlight falls across the license plate, highlighting the letters S-T-N. He never noticed that before. How blind he was. As he crouches, searing pain swells inside his chest, prompting an involuntary yelp, Ah! but he forces himself to maintain position until finally making it to the side of the barn. He takes note of the slightly ajar window, above and to the left. Ah! The wave of pain begins to subside a little, and he warily creeps around to the truck, noticing the half-sized door in the side of the barn. Holding his breath, he pulls the door open. Jackpot, he whispers. Bit of good luck for a change. Behind the plastic bags is a stockpile of wood, and adjacent to that is a red container. He grabs it and makes his way back to the open window. The crickets cease their tune, and immediately he feels more exposed, as if it's a cue for something to happen. He holds his breath, snapping his head from left to right, half expecting one of them to come rushing from the darkness, but not a sound, inside or out. Taking a deep breath, he carefully pulls the window towards him, inspecting the void of darkness on the other side. Momentarily, fear overrides the pain, but his mind is made up. The arduous scramble to the barn was only ever a one-way ticket. Bracing himself for the inevitable pain, he clambers through, arms flailing ahead in the darkness, fingers wrapped securely around the three-quarters full container. He's halfway in, straddling the frame, fighting the urge to cry as nerve endings sing their hypersensitive warnings. Shit! His elbows break the fall, the impact sending painful vibrations across his body that prompts another muffled cry into his arm. He's in a bathroom, the oppressive stench of piss and vomit laying at the back of his throat. Holding his breath, he waits for the inevitable thuds of footsteps, but aside from the moans of the house, nothing. He closes and locks the window behind him. The door creaks as he nudges it open. And there, amid dozens of empty liquor bottles and a carpet of syringes, ungracefully sprawled across couches and chairs, are the ones that left him for dead. Four of them in total. Three guys and the bait, sleeping off a hearty meal of drugs, fear, and cruelty. He guesses it was his cash that paid for the drugs. Another shudder works its way down his aching spine. Fear. Rage. Everything in between. Grimacing with each creak of the floorboards, he begins limping his way through the darkness, stopping suddenly at the explosion of noise. He freezes, heart pounding, skin crawling and frightened to take a breath eyeing the glass bottle as it rolls impossibly loudly towards the chair where Paul sleeps. Shit, I'm done. Heart thumping, ripples of pain reverberating with each beat. He watches it come to rest, just short of the chair leg. Seconds pass. Not a murmur. <sighs> Breathing a sigh of relief, knowing this is his second and last life, he continues on his way. He's in the small kitchen area now. More good luck. Box of safety matches on the counter next to the stove. They must be on the grid. Let's call it insurance. Reaching across, he turns the knob, 
grateful and terrified to hear the accompanying hiss. No backing out now. Performing a quick scout of the room, he drags blankets, throws, cushions onto the floor, anything that will burn quickly. He locks two more windows, and finally, the main door, carefully sliding the empty bookcase across for good measure. Working his way slowly around, he douses the floors, curtains, and walls with gasoline, pouring what's left onto the clothes of his attackers. Thanks for listening. He whispers in Jessica's ear and proceeds to splash the liquid generously across her shirt and jeans. The needle still hangs from her arm. Hands surprisingly steady, or perhaps not, given his inherent love of fire, he lights the first match. Studying the glorious orange flame until it licks at his flesh. Unable to hold it any longer, he releases the match but it extinguishes before hitting the ground. There's a moan from the chair in front. Vince, the worst of them, the ringleader. Say a word about this to anyone, and we'll come after everyone you love in your pathetic little life. John remembers letting out a pained laugh at that comment. The boots started to come in even harder then. Lighting another match, he guides it towards one of the gas-drenched blankets and lets it go. An undramatic whoosh adds a blast of warmth to the cold, and he watches, mesmerized by the fiery complexity of colors. Urgently, he lights more, flicking them randomly around the room. Some go out before they hit the deck, but others fulfill their duty in a blaze of glory. Not a murmur. John guesses his cash bought an awful lot of drugs. Wood crackles as flame hungrily begins to devour the barn, spreading even quicker than he imagined. He eases himself onto the couch next to Jessica so he can watch the show, stifling a cough and grimacing at the accompanying pain. Since childhood, he's had a love affair with fire. After a beating, he'd often go down to the local woods and set fire to things in anger, pretending it was him, whoever that was at the time. For hours he'd sit, watching the embers float high into the dullness of the sky. He used to drift into a daze, at once mesmerized by the ethereal beauty, and awed by its hunger to destroy everything in its path. It was as though the world stopped to appreciate the beauty. Sometimes he imagined he was the fire, roaring across town, hungry for devastation. And then there was that evening the sirens broke his trance. He took one hell of a beating for that. Couldn't walk for days. Already it's getting hard to breathe. And the heat. Jesus, the heat. He stifles a scream. An oppressive black fog works its way around the room, as though death's shadow itself is here to collect. It's almost upon him. Don't deserve this. Coughing erupts, accompanied by piercing, ear-splitting screams. As the fire works its way up his legs, the pain becomes unbearable, and he squeals a high-pitched wail that blends into the others. His skin is blistering and peeling away, fizzing and popping. He can smell it as he reaches for Jessica's hand. Within the thick smoke, things are moving, and he hears the thuds of footsteps. Help! A human flame runs in front of him, crashing against the bookcase in desperation. It's Vince. John forces a smile as the man turns. You bastard! Vince cries, launching towards him, an eye beginning to bubble down his chin. But he doesn't make it, crumpling to the floor in a series of whimpers. From beside John... Jessica finally begins to cough, already half engulfed in flames. There's no pain anymore, but the smell of burning flesh is making him sick. He closes his eyes, and Olivia appears. 
eyes full of excitement as she stands on the opposite side of the road. This time, it's him walking towards her. He wanted children desperately. He idolized Olivia. They were trying for another when she was taken. I'm coming, sweetie. But suddenly, the road is filled with black smoke, and he's running blind. Daddy! No! 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 Olivia! He swats at the smoke, but it's so thick. Can't see! Daddy! Olivia! He opens his eyes, only to be watching the cabin burn from a distance now, orange flames whipping around the wood. A deafening explosion rings in his ears. He has no idea how long he's been here. Days? Weeks? They all blend into one. This place is so bleak and depressing. Charred rock wherever you look, and some of the most unsavory characters you could ever have the misfortune to meet. It doesn't smell like he would have expected. More like laundry that's dried too quickly indoors, with the faint undertones of rotten egg. He never gets used to it. Morning, John. New skin cream? It's James. Thinks he's a comedian. John's cooked skin being the butt of his many jokes. Hi, James. How's the family? Smothered them all in their sleep and then hung himself from the garage ceiling. Ooh, good burn. You're on fire today, John. <laughs> How's the project coming? Fine, just fine. Should be done today. And then I'll get my hands on that golden ticket. What about you? Yeah, okay. It should be good. Working on it. Wow, so much confidence. Clock's ticking, friend. Catch ya. This is his life now. I don't deserve this. He thought death would reunite him with Olivia. But apparently, you don't walk through the pearly gates after barbecuing fellow humans, regardless of whether they psychologically qualify for that status. It seems that life is fucked, even when it ends. He had nothing but anger when he first arrived, and his blood still boils when he thinks about how life has violated him. But emotions don't serve you well here. There's a faint soundtrack of suffering to complement the ambiance in the background. Moans and blood-curdling screams, the eternal suffering of those that don't graduate, and an unsubtle reminder of what happens if you don't perform. I'm not making much sense, but in layman's terms, think of this place as a holding bay for those deemed not quite evil enough for hell. They call it Middle World, a proving ground if you like. Reading through his project notes, John momentarily drifts into his previous life, a memory of himself, Evie and Olivia roasting marshmallows over a campfire. He remembers the fire dancing in her eyes and, stop it, John. Nostalgic melancholy is dangerous here, been known to drive people insane. This isn't hell. This is worse. Found what's left of your balls yet, John? Terry slurs on the way past. John's not sure if he's referring to his project, Alex, the human that he has to turn to prove himself, or the injury to his ball sack where Jessica tried her hand at castration with a blunt and rusty knife. Waiting until he saunters past, John flicks him the finger and shudders with a surge of rage. Fucking middle management. Terry's only been here a couple of weeks, but already made a name for himself as a mean bastard. John wants to scream, but knows it won't do any good. Besides, he doesn't want to give Terry any excuses, especially as he's the one tasked to decide if John will graduate or not. Before he blew half his head off with a shotgun, Terry stabbed his wife 36 times and drowned his three-month-old son in a bath full of water. People in the know told John that the neighbors found Terry in the garage, a blood-spattered photo album resting on his knee, him and his mates on a fishing trip. He finds it hard to take a man with half a head seriously. With what's left of his mouth, it's also often difficult to understand what Terry's saying. 
People call him Half-Brain because of the incident. And, well, if the shoe fits. He's mean with it, though. The meanest of them all. Got his ticket straight, though. None of this in-between stuff. Rumors fly around about things he used to get up to on home soil. But there's a lot of tittle-tattle around here. And John never knows what to believe sometimes. Anyway, Terry's turning the screws on him big time. He hates him. Thinks what he did was cheap. An easy way out. But burning to death isn't something John would recommend. And he certainly believes it demands a greater accolade than cheap. So, to summarize... This crowd are all imprisoned in this dark limbo with only one thing in common. They're all trainees, destined for hell, but still with something to prove before they get tickets. There's a huge mixture of prospects, those that aspire to be evil and those that made a mistake. A massive error in judgment spurred by rage and vengeance that has forever sealed their fate. But either way, they're all in the same boat trying to get their hands on that ticket out of Middle World, the alternative too unbearable to contemplate. And hell is supposed to be beautiful. That's the rumor, anyway. Anything your heart desires without ever having to get your hands dirty. And once you work your way through middle management, early retirement is on the cards. All rumors, though. John bid farewell to George last week, a friend of sorts. George was too ashamed to tell him what he did. Ran out of time. Couldn't bring himself to complete his project. And now poor George has to relive his death over and over for eternity. The pain would be horrendous enough, but repetition would drive anyone out of their minds. John knows he has no other choice but to follow orders. If he doesn't, he knows Terry would be at the front of the queue, first in line to witness his eternal damnation. Time is running out for John that he knows it. Terry gave him a wink this morning in the progress meeting, even gave him a smile, and he never smiles. Terry doesn't think he'll be able to do it, and he's positively gleeful about it. The shaving mirror on his desk isn't really a mirror at all. Think of it as a window to the old world. John has him in sight now. He's human. Alex. Parked at the cliffside, Alex is sitting in his car overlooking the expanse of dark water, a ferocious tune crackling loudly through the radio. Waves explode against the rocks beneath with thundering ferocity, but Alex just stares into the horizon, eyes vacant and full of insignificance. John knows that feeling well. Beginning to beat the dashboard, Alex lets out a raw and pained cry that is muffled by the thrashing waves. He begins to swing his head from side to side, relentlessly pounding his fists against the glass, the wheel, and the chair, letting out inhumane roars and spraying spittle across the windscreen. Blood runs down his lip, and tears roll down both cheeks. There's even a bubble of snot coming from his nose. John relates to the anger, the hopelessness. A red car pulls up less than 20 feet away. The woman... Catching sight of Alex, assumedly thrashing maniacally away to some obscure heavy metal track, wheel skids against the gravel and pulls away quickly. Finally, Alex's violence begins to slow, and the wildness gives way to a series of pathetic whimpers. John is unable to summon his inner demon to do his job. When he looks down on this man and his tiny, ineffectual life, he only feels pity. Beyond the superficial smiles and happy family charade, there's a surging torrent of pain flowing through Alex. And the truth is, John feels sorry for him. Alex reminds him of himself. Not an alpha male, but a pleaser, just trying to make their way through. Leaving for work each day, briefcase in hand, Alex never makes it there. If he did, he would be unwelcome. The bills are stacking up. Phone calls coming in, and he can't cover forever. Alex has driven to this cliffside each day for the last two weeks, thoughts of jumping on his mind. Each time he gets a little closer, but he'll never do it. He's too weak. Won't even step out of the car. John's in his head, you see, privy to his darkest thoughts, and it's his job to turn him evil, 
create carnage before he leaves this world. The devil preys on the vulnerable. Alex is crying now, caressing the wheel as though it's a loved one. Serving his notice at work a few weeks ago, Alex returned home early, only to find his best friend's car parked two doors down. Moans from the bedroom confirmed his suspicions. Their four-year-old daughter was left to her own devices, watching television in the downstairs lounge. It should be so easy to tap into his mind, set the demons loose. Why can't I? Faced with the eternal repetition of burning alive, why does John hesitate? The problem is, each time he gets into Alex's head, attempts to evoke anger are quashed by pity, neutralized by compassion. Even after everything that world put John through, he guesses he still has a long way to go before he can call himself evil. Shit. Alex is getting out of the car. He's never done that before. Gravel crunching beneath his feet, he maintains his stare towards the horizon, hair blowing wildly and face screwed up defensively. Reaching the edge of the cliff, he shuffles forward until the toes of his shoes are just hanging over. What is he muttering? He's singing the lines from the song on the radio. It's far too late to follow the light. Take that path of most delight. Follow the voice that speaks deep and low. Or get fucked over by foe or hoe. Catchy. Alex closes his eyes and lets his body sway in the wind that embraces the exposed cliffside, rough waters crashing against the sharp rocks waiting below. John can feel what he feels, smells what he smells, and god damn it, it's wonderful. The breeze, a refreshing change from the stifling air he's become accustomed to, and the sea air nostalgically divine, reminding him of trips to the beach with Evie and Olivia, how it always took so long to convince Olivia that it was home time. Focus, John. If he jumps, it's over for him. Eternal pain and the smell of his own cooking flesh. It's like picking locks. You need to find the right doors and patiently work at them until you hear a click. Then you move on to the next one. I'm simplifying it, obviously, but you catch my drift. There are all sorts of dark surprises in there. For instance, John has just learned Alex killed the family pet, told his wife and three-year-old daughter that the rabbit just escaped. A plausible explanation, as it was always him that had to chase the furry little fucker down, but the last time Alex caught it, he was so full of rage that he split his bottom lip open as he crushed the poor thing's neck. Perhaps there's more to Alex than meets the eye. What do they say about animal killers? There's rage in all of us. Always comes out in the end, one way or the other. Paranoia is one of the most effective tools of the demon. And right now, John is filling his head with thoughts of his wife's infidelity. How long has it been going on? Once a cheater, always a cheater. She did it upstairs while your daughter was downstairs watching TV. She's probably laughing with her friends behind your back. Little devils sat on your shoulder filling you with resentment and jealousy, whether they want to or not. Are you going to let her get away with it, Alex? Yeah. See how easy it is to fuel? <laughs> Knuckles white from clenching, Alex begins to tremble, chest heaving frenetically. He takes a step back, and John affords himself a sigh of relief. John's in there now, working at the remaining doors. <laughs> Leveraging on every incident, every interaction Alex ever had that made him feel secondary, and they're all too familiar to him. This town is unforgiving. It swallows you whole. <coughs> Alex steps back into the car. Now, John is feeling it. The rage. Channeling Alex's anger is opening his own doors, too. They are at one, adrenaline coursing through them, sick of the injustice and keen for some resolve. The engine rumbles into action, and the music kicks in again as John's exposed teeth bear down on savagely burned lips. Alex's hands are white as they lock around the steering wheel, in the zone now, the one John knows so well. Letting out a roar, Alex churns the wheels against the gravel and heads for home.
Houses blur past. He's just run a red light. Two blocks away, and Alex is making a low and raspy murmuring noise that sounds like a growl. Images in his head are playing out. Scenes of horrific revenge that even shock John. Not just against the wife, but his... No. Alex's growl turns to maniacal laughter as he floors the accelerator. What have I done? Shit, I can't do this. Can't carry it through. Screeching to a halt outside the house, Alex throws the car door open and rushes to the front door. It's too late. Have to try. Think. The first thing Alex does is turn on the gas. John made him do that. Part of his new plan. At least give them a fighting chance. Make it look like he tried to kill them and hopefully still get his ticket. Besides, it's his signature move now. John's in his head again. Alex is wondering who she's screwing now. Through Alex's eyes, he sees the photos lining the hallway as he stealthily marches upstairs. Daughter's birthday. Huge cake with the number four on top. Alex's wife standing behind, ready with the knife, beaming so proudly. Alex is wondering where his daughter is. 4.30 p.m. She should be home from kindergarten by now. The bedroom door is ajar, and Alex peeks through only to find his wife and daughter curled up in bed together, asleep. John decides he can't do it, that he's out. He wonders if he ever genuinely thought he could. Nothing is worth the guilt he would carry for eternity if they perished. Look how peaceful and angelic they are, nestled in between the soft white sheets. And does infidelity warrant being burned alive? We're all insecure and vulnerable, trying to make our way through this shit show. And what about the child? John begins closing the doors again, one by one. Melancholy creeps across Alex's face as he continues to watch his sleeping family, rigid lines softening, and the fire behind his eyes losing some venom. His breathing is becoming slower, more controlled. This is good. The doubt. John tries to leverage it. So many doors to close. He spent hours wandering around these dark alleys trying to find his way around. But Alex's face changes back. In our bed. Where you sleep with our child, you slut. No. Alex retreats down the stairs, but his rage is black. John can feel it, even see the physical cloak of darkness that is growing around the man. Mumbling profanities, Alex makes his way to the kitchen and begins to rifle through drawers. John hopes at least he's searching for matches. He pulls out a knife. Damn. Too many doors. Too much work already done. Weeks invested in this man. Already halfway up the stairs, Alex is seething, saliva dripping towards the carpet, a knife shaking in his right hand. I think I've lost him. No. Please, no. John decides he can't witness the act. Far beyond his conception of evil. He stays downstairs and tries again, but the alleyways of Alex's mind are filling with fog. It's futile. Aside from the hissing, everything feels normal. The arrangement of fridge magnets to spell the word unicorn, and the empty wine glass stained with lipstick. Under the letter U is a photo of Alex's daughter wearing a frilly white dress, blue framed sunglasses turned upside down, and oversized rain boots. It reminds John of Olivia, crazy, hungry for life. Muffled pleas sound above John's head, accompanied by a thunderous rush of footsteps across the ceiling. He watches the swing of the small chandelier and winces as the loud, piercing scream rings out. What have I done? A shudder runs down his charred spine, and crippling pain rips through his insides. There's an urge to cry. Pressure developing behind his eyes, but no working tear ducts to release. More footsteps across the ceiling, softer this time. And silence. Immeasurable grief sweeps over him, a sorrow that brings him close to the depths of the days following Olivia's death. He looks back to the fridge at the upside down sunglasses and wants to be anywhere but here, even back in the middle land. 
but he knows he needs to finish this now. Needs to collect Alex's soul. Otherwise, it will all have been for nothing. John hears Alex coming down the stairs. Slowly this time, breathing heavy and labored. He sees the bottom of Alex's flannel shirt, covered in the blood spatter of the wife and child who were peacefully sleeping moments ago. The knife's still in his hand, dripping more of the crimson across the wooden steps. Confusion is drawn across his face, lines creased across his forehead and pale skin framing eyes that look impossibly dark. He pauses at the bottom of the stairs, mumbling something inaudible, and runs the knife across his neck. In a gurgling heap, and as the life begins to leak from him, he turns to look at John. He sees me. Alex lets out a long, raspy exhale. Is that a smile? John knows they will both most likely get a ticket straight through for this, but he doesn't feel like celebrating. He waits for the inhale from the bleeding man in front of him, but it doesn't come. The house feels evil now. Bad. He has no reason to linger. He closes his eyes. And he's back. Back in the dark, cavernous place that he temporarily calls home. Immediately, he notices the envelope on his desk that is furnished with a red ribbon and seal. The ticket. He begins to cry. It's all too much for him. Most of the reprobates here would be overjoyed at such a sight, but he's just witnessed the demise of a family, and regardless of the fact he didn't really have a choice, keep telling yourself that, John. The sight of it evokes no emotion. A four-year-old child, the same age as Olivia. How can one distance oneself from something like that? Unless you are evil to the core. But I guess that's the point. The envelope feels weighty. Stiff. His finger slides onto the flap to echoes of the mother's screams and the child's plea. Inside is a photograph that ignites a fire within him. No fucking way. Terry. He studies the print in disbelief. Five of them all stood proudly on the riverbank, fishing rods in hand, some of them sporting a catch, and all wearing those fucking disgusting smiles. Terry. Vince. Paul, Lyle, and Jessica. There's a note on the back of the photograph. John, expecting to find a ticket? Too bad. I heard you have a fondness for fire and burning flesh. Well, that has been arranged. I want you to remember this day for a long time, and I do believe you will. You killed my old gang. Thick as blood we were. Swore an oath we'd look out for each other until the Reaper came. And that stood, even after I had a go at life the right way. I sucked at it, incidentally. And when I found out someone had killed him, man, the rage. For that, you have my wife and baby's blood on your hands. But I guess you've already worked that one out. Those people in that photograph are my true family. Always will be. And what a reunion we had. Boy, the things we did in the old world. But I guess you know all about that. They send their regards, by the way. Wanted to come, but it's busy down there. Is that smoke I smell? P.S. Thanks for killing my weakest piss fuck wit brother and his horrible wife. Expect I'll bump into him soon. Be a different man now, I imagine. Damn shame about their little girl, though. Love your work, Terry. Darkness falls as footsteps emanate from behind John. His broken and burned body begins to tremble towards a crescendo of spasms, his breathing quick and loud. Since appearing from the womb, he's been fucked over. His father leaving before the event, and his mother going through a series of boyfriends in varying states of alcohol-induced stupors. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. Shit on my shoe. Beating after beating, he just took it, 
did as he was told, but it didn't help. Finally, he got out of that place and built a life for himself, hard as it was. So many scars, and it would have been so easy to take the other path. Listen to the voices that often spoke in his head, the whispers of the demons that sat on his shoulders, the ones he knows all too well now. But either way, it seems he's always been destined for it. A childhood of pain and humiliation. Thought he could leave it behind. Got married. Wife had an affair. Forgave her. Had a daughter. Daughter was taken. Fuck! I don't deserve this! I'm sorry, John. But it's your time. James offers deadpan, possibly even a bit of compassion in his voice. This isn't right. As hands emerge from the darkness to pull him back, he can already feel the fire's intensity and can see the orange flames in his peripheral vision. Everything he's been through, all the shit he's taken in life, and this, the reward. No! He begins to fight, batting the hands away, but more replace them. This isn't right! This isn't fair! Ahead, Terry steps out of the curtain of darkness. He's here for the show, fanning his face and smiling. I did what was asked of me! John hears the crackle and snapping of wood and turns his head around to find himself back in the barn, sitting next to Jessica. He tries to get up, but can't, paralyzed, but still able to feel the approaching heat. Descent into Hell, Part 1, Last Laugh, was written by Mark Taus, with performances by Graham Rowett, Sarah Ruth Thomas, and me, Jason Wilson. Musical composition was by J.M. Scherf. Episode artwork, web development, and creative direction by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon management by Brooks Bigley. Videography by Hale Scherf. Audio engineering and sound design was by me, Jason Wilson. We wanted to take this time to thank you, our patrons, once again, and to any of those who have taken the time to leave us a five-star rating and a review. Those reviews keep us at the top of the charts and makes it easier for more twisted souls to find the show. The Grey Rooms is also streaming for free on Spotify. Just get the Spotify app or open the browser and search The Grey Rooms. And you know, we here at The Grey Rooms love our fans. And we want to give back to you in the best way that, well, we know how. So we have a lot of fun things to show you and we hope that you like them all, like this, the mini-series. You can find out more by joining us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, YouTube, Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all of the tortured souls who have passed through the rooms. Our emotional support group is always looking to help you with all of your... needs. And don't forget about our merch store. It's full of epic designs and logos for you to sport, showing the world that you are a survivor of these very rooms. Now, all of this can be found in the show notes or on our website, thegrayrooms.com. And last but not least, the lovely Discord channel. I can't stress enough when I say this is the best community in all of Discord. People are here to support each other. People are here to be wonderfully friendly to each other. It's a great retreat from the chaos we all are experiencing right now in the world. Come join us as a guest or as a patron. We do plenty of fun things over there. Interact, help each other with our edits, play video games with each other. We just had our first movie night last night, and it was a ton of fun. There's always something to do at our Discord, and I think that you would fill a void by signing up today. Head on over there and jump in the fun. This was part one of Descent into Hell by Mark Taus. Be ready for more to come tomorrow. We hope you enjoy it, and we'll see you soon. Bye.